Okay, so we're gonna. Thank you. So we're gonna continue. Let me pick up a few of the things that I said that, uh, towards the end of the lecture, given that some of the questions um, kind of revealed some things that probably was were not clear. So let me just re re retell the story a little bit. So the first thing first, if we're gonna be doing physics, our problem has to be well posed, and if not, then we're it's not clear what we're doing. And so I'll give you some examples uh, soon of where some problems that are formally not well posed coming up naturally uh, in physics, uh, depending on what we're trying to do. But let's imagine it is well posed, and we're gonna say a few more things on that. So then we want to make sure, if we're gonna convince anyone, and that anyone should start with ourselves, that what we have is the right solution. We need to make sure that convergence is satisfied, stability is satisfied, and consistency is satisfied. And I'll say a few more things about here. We were mainly talking first about convergence in the sense that, well, we introduce a discrete, uh, a discretization of our problem that either involves some spacing in between points or say the number of points or the number of basis functions taken to infinity or the spacing to zero should give us back our original problem. If that's not the case, we're solving something else. Uh, stability, okay, how do we do that? We have to be careful because we know that well, postness allows for the solution to blow up. We have true physical problems where the solution does blow up. So we want to make sure that we can tell the difference between an artificial blow up because of some feature in the way we're implementing things. And I'll tell you why in a second. It's very likely that if we are not careful, we can introduce these modes that are completely spurious. Um, and of course, then we have to also make sure that consistency, that we are recovering our original problem, that we didn't um, make a mistake in the way we wrote it, and at the end we'll just change the problem. And I'll, I'll show you, I'll tell you a few examples. So before I go there, <clears throat> let me go back to this example that I very quickly went through. So suppose you're trying to approximate the, the spatial derivative of your function, whatever that is. So we say, well, this is an approximation, it's an approximation in finite differences. Uh, which says, well, take the grid, and if, assume, if I'm assuming that the points are equal space, I take the point at the right to the one I'm interested in, minus the point at the left, the value of the function and the point, divided by two delta, and that will be my approximation. And we can prove this is just Taylor's approximation, which of course, hidden in it, is an assumption that we can make a Taylor approximation, that the solution is sufficiently smooth. So let's assume that, and of course, at the point i plus one, I can have this expansion, and of course this expansion continues. And at the point i minus one, it's the same except every now and then we take, pick a, bi a minus sign. If we take this difference, then you can prove that to leading order, the discrete derivative, derivative at the point i happens to be equal to the continuous derivative plus, well, it's a factor times the third derivative multiplied by the spacing square. And of course, there are higher order here with respect to delta to some higher powers. So the error here that we're making is given by a second order. This is why this approximation is said to be second order accurate. If we bring delta to zero, we get closer and closer to the problem we're trying to solve with delta. But this also tells us what the equation is that we're solving. Once we kind of implement the code and we put it in the, com in the computer, and that's a kind of a, an abuse of terminology, we're not doing, let's imagine that our problem was f comma t equal f comma x. Let's imagine that for the sake of the argument, we keep time continuous, but we only discretize in space. So we're not solving this equation anymore. The equation we're solving is this equation. to leading order. So this equation has nice uh, propagating speeds of speed one, and I'll go into it in a second. But the moment we add that, and which we're adding by fiat by construction, well, things start to vary a little bit. And the way these things interact, especially in nonlinear problems, might do something to us. So let me go back to these equations, which I used to kind of motivate the type of solution that we could have in one problem in the R1. They were the only thing I changed is here, I have a one, 
you know, here I have an I. We say that at least locally we can always think of representing things in Fourier modes. So we're thinking that the, my solution, at least at some point locally in time, is given by some coefficients times e to the i k x, some overall possible case. Um, if I have now a dependence in time, then I will have some e to the s t, where s I mean, also depends on k. And our task is to find out what this s is. So if I put this in here, what I found is that s was equal to a k, i k. So for any k, s happened to be i k. But then the norm of u at time t is e to st e to the i k x, right? But s is i a to the i k, so the norm is e to the i k t norm e to the i k x norm, so that's one. So for all times, we don't have anything that grows, it's independent of k and so on. But when we put it here, this is one we got instead. And if k happens to be negative, which it can be, then we're going to have a blow up. So our definition of well posed as well, Hadamard's definition of well posed says, if we compound it this way where the exponent here is independent of the mode of the solution or the initial data, and beta also independent, then we're good. But here what we have is beta being k or minus k. So this is blowing up. So as long as we have some wave number that can go to a very large number, or if you want a wavelength to go to a very small uh, number, then we're screwed. But our condition of convergence requires us to be able to take the delta to zero or the n to infinity. So then we're gonna be in tension. Okay, so is, is that clear? Okay. So now let me recover or say one more thing. I'm going to see how we use it. I'm going to break this. Uh, I'm going to, not going to touch it anymore. Well, I wouldn't even want to cover that. Okay. You're going to bring that to the middle? Right. Okay, so now, suppose we're first in one plus one, so one space, one time, and we wrote this general system now. And we said this A, in principle, A and B can depend on U, can be functions of U. But we said that if A has all real eigenvalues, uh, then that's a that's a necessary condition for the problem to be well posed. If A has all real eigenvalues and diagonalizable, that's a sufficient condition for the system to be well posed independent, as independent. So if instead A has all real eigenvalues depending on N, depending on B, it may be but typically you're not gonna be as lucky because the B's these things could be very complicated. So an example 
Of these, as you may, some of you might have seen the ADM decomposition of Einstein equations. I'll give a little bit of a refresher. That uh, decomposition uh, satisfies this property, but not that other one. So if, if let's say, prop one and two, so if one, the system is said to be weakly hyperbolic. If two, unfortunately we have strongly symmetric and symmetrizable hyperbolic. We have three conditions. Uh, I'm not gonna make a strong point about the differences. And the only, or the main difference is whether, if you're now thinking in n plus one, So if you now have a structure like this, so now it's in all dimensions, if the uh, transformation that diagonalizes each individual matrix is independent of the direction, then it's symmet symmetric or hyperbolic. If you have a different transformation per direction, but it's still all the, um, all the Jordan forms are diagonal, regardless of the direction, even though you may have to choose different transformations. If they are all diagonal, then it's strongly hyperbolic. Either way, you're in the best possible scenario. So a lot of the work that has been going on in implementations in general relativity from the late 90s have been focused on this. In fact, it was one of the reasons or one of the main ingredients on breaking up uh, the block that was getting in the way to being able to do numerical relativity in higher dimensions. By higher dimensions, I mean not in assuming special symmetries. And we'll discuss this as we go along. But we get, if we have this structure, we get many other things kind of all together. So one, which I'll discuss uh, now. No, that's not the one is the issues of boundaries. So after all, we, we typically have boundaries, either because we're solving, um, so let's say we start with Einstein's equations, try to find the, uh, the, the solution of the full space time, but typically we don't include all the space time for several reasons. Um, so let me get to those reasons later when we uh, discuss a particular uh, implementation, particular first the ADM. But typically we're gonna end up choosing a boundaries uh, of finite domain, or if we're doing ads -CFT, our boundary may be the ADS boundary. So we need to deal about, uh, think about boundaries. We also might have a boundary in the black hole. So we have a, our event horizon. We have to ask the question, what are we do, gonna do with that singularity that is inside? And we're gonna discuss two options. One is to excise things, so we can decide not to solve some portion of the, for some portion of the space time. And if we're doing things correctly, we will be able to get away with it, assuming an event horizon exists. We'll talk about that. Or we may have, we may be able to choose a weird slicing, and there is a poster uh, talking about that, uh, with some, something called the trumpet slicing, that kind of does avoid hitting the singularity. Again, we'll discuss about that. But we need to make sure that our formulation that implicitly also includes a choice of gauge is amenable to doing this. It's not a priori clear that you're gonna be able to do that. So how, we need to understand how we're gonna analyze that and then uh, we'll discuss some examples. But the first thing is to boundaries. So given a problem that is defined in whatever way, so we might have this. This is our computational domain. This might be, say, the x direction or the radial direction. So we're trying to solve what's going on inside. We need to understand what we're gonna do here and here. And if we have to do something in those boundaries for the problem to be uh, correctly set. So this is useful because now we know that we can diagonalize that metric. So if this is any dimension, 
uh, let's call this dimension one, so let's call it x, then the only thing I need to do is to look as, at a, ax, because ay, say, and az, if we're thinking of Cartesian, have derivatives that are tangential to that boundary. The only one where we're having problems is when we need to go through. And for that, let me go back to that de uh, uh, definition of a derivative. If we're using, again, a second order, find a difference thing, our derivatives are this. So I'm jumping back and forth between continuum and discrete considerations, um, just because they are intertwined. So if, I, if I'm here, at two points, I can always, at this point, I can always use the boundary, the neighboring two points to define the derivative. But once I'm here, then I don't have this point, so what do I do with it? So I need, this is where physics comes in, the physics of boundaries is, impo is important to consider. So the first thing is to come in here, look at that matrix, which is the one, the only one that involves derivatives that kind of need information beyond our computational domain. And by understanding what the eigenvalues of this matrix is, this matrix is we can understand what variable is coming from the right, where is, what variable is going from the left. Remember, okay, I'm gonna write it here. If we have u comma t equal, say u comma x, and let me put a lambda plus here, just a notation, that says the particular eigenvalue corresponding to that eigenvector. Okay, sorry, we were using the terminology v, so let me put, change it to v. So this tells me there is a mode that propagates from right to left at speed lambda plus. If I have v comma t equal lambda minus, now lambda minus is negative. This tells me there is a mode that is moving from left to right at that speed. And if you happen to be zero, then uh, to linear order, or the, to, sorry, to the principal part, so this thing is called the principal part, And all these are lower order terms. So that's another thing we gain for free if we're working for with a structure where the matrix is strongly hyperbolic or symmetric hyperbolic, or the problem is strongly hyperbolic or symmetric hyperbolic, is that we don't need to care about this thing. It will determine the particular solution that we may be seeking for, but the main properties are, are, are described by this principal part. So remember when we, I was discussing the wave equation by introducing the variables, I think I called them f and p and pi. Our problem became, oh, there it goes again. So, okay, this was our problem. The first thing first, okay, what we see here is this structure. If I put things in, in this ve vector, our matrix becomes, okay, zero, zero, zero. There is no, nothing being derived on the right-hand side in here, so this is in the lower order term, uh, will be one, zero, zero then everything is zero. Sorry, no, it's zero, zero, one, zero. Okay, and here I have this vector. Sorry, I ran out of space. That's a vector that is matrix multiplying. So I don't see any derivative here, so my first row is zero. Here I see Zero, zero, one, because only f of x comes in. And zero, here I see zero, one, zero. So our task would be, okay, come in here. This is our matrix. Compute the eigenvalues. If you compute the eigenvalues, you're gonna find one, minus one, and zero. So the one and minus one are the physical ones. You expected that. You knew that was the case in here. But then what is that third one? There is a zero. Well, that comes because one of our equations is essentially just a constraint. 
which is hidden in here. So it's a slightly redundant. So you can ignore, like, here is where the dynamics happens, pi and f evolve, and then once I know pi and f, a very trivial iteration gives us phi. So you're gonna find that associated to lambda equal to zero uh, is a eigenvector, say, one, zero, zero. So that says phi does not have a non-trivial eigenvalue associated to it. Associated to lambda plus, which is equal to one, is the one, sorry, the zero, one, one. I don't care, I don't need to, for this discussion to normalize it, just to know what combination will give me what that. And then for lambda minus, which is minus one, is zero, one, minus one which we already kind of knew that because if we add and subtract these two, we had something where the variable was equal to itself with a plus derivative and space derivative or it to itself with a minus. These were the two modes. But this is now telling us there is this combination that has a positive eigenvalue. So to that combination, I can do something on the right boundary. So if something is moving from right to left, physics is given in that boundary. This left boundary I cannot touch. I don't have the right to tell this function what it should be here. It's just moving from right to left. And if I try to tell it what I want it to be, generically we're gonna have some inconsistency. It will generate noise and this noise will mess up my solution. To the R combination, the f minus pi or pi minus f, that's a mode that moves from left to right. So f plus, f plus pi moves right to left, f minus pi moves in the opposite direction. So that's a combination, I can do something on the left hand side, it would move to the right, but I can't do any, nothing on the right hand side with respect to f minus pi. So this tells us that if this is a system we're gonna be working with, the, at the practical level, the only consistent way or the consistent way of setting boundary conditions is saying, what do you want for f minus pi? What do you want for f plus pi? Put it here, put it there. And effectively what you do is to replace the need of knowing something here by that boundary condition. Is that clear? Okay. We might say more about this in a, in a, uh, as we go along with, specific, with another specific example. But this is uh, what I stress, what I want to stress here is knowing that structure, we're buying a lot. So we know that our speeds are given by the matrix. That speed tells us where and how the boundary conditions are to be attempted. And we're gonna get more out of this. What else? Uh -huh. Okay, so we can get a little bit more, and this, let me, let me connect with, um, with the issue of uh, stability. Again, let me go back to this equation. And now we know why we can keep going to this equation. Because of what? If we have a strongly or symmetric hyperbolic system, we have a system that formally uh, can be turned into a sequence of just one dimension, one dimensional advection equations. We use our transformation, we use the fact that we can diagonalize our matrix, and if we do that, we just have a collection of advection equations. Is that, is that clear? Okay, so that's key. Because we can do that, and even we, if I had a lambda here, I can always absorb it. I can make a next quarterly transformation that absorbs that lambda. So we can always even just do that. This is why Gustafsson owned an island, no, Christ owned an island in Sweden. So 
just keep looking into this. So now let's think about a, as a mathematician. So our mathematician will prove stability of a problem and, um, and at the same time consistency and, uh, and, sorry, and uniqueness and well posing should follow. The way, one way of doing it is thinking of an energy norm. So, so imagine you have an energy, which I'm gonna define this way. So your, yourself as a mathematician working on PDE will want to know, can I, can I bound this energy? So there is a norm, non-negative defined norm, and you want to ask, how is this gonna change? And if the change in time I can bound somehow, uh, and the bounds satisfy Hadamard conditions, then I'm done, because the problem will uh, then, uh, stability will follow, and, and then by knowing how rapidly this energy changes, I can say something about the stability of the system. So let's start, start here, take the time derivative, and here is where my mathematician uh, goes away because I'm gonna draw factors of two, I mean, I don't care about those. So if I take the time derivative, I have u, u dot, and also I'm gonna stop caring for the dx, I mean, this is just schematically. So, so far we're good, and now I take, I replace with my equation this by that, u, u comma x, I use integration by parts. So here I use the equation of motion, and here I do integration by parts, and here I just integrate. Right, so this is my, the rate of change of my energy is equal to whatever I have for a function at the right boundary square minus uh, what I have in the left boundary square. And now it's beautiful because you say, well, physically, if I have my problem and I'm setting my boundary, again, my problem was u comma t equal u comma x. I see that I have a positive sign here. Information comes from right to left. I'm gonna choose to not give anything here. So it better be that my function, where I have put physics here, I have a, a, a mode that can propagate inside, but once it goes past this boundary, we left, it will leave, we uh, intuitively think that the energy should be decaying, because it, I'm not replenishing from the right, and I'm letting it go on the left. And that's what it is telling us. If I set ur to zero, this is saying, well, it should be, the energy should be negatively, the rate of change of the energy should be negative, and it will be just telling how energy is, is coming out. So now, suppose you want to say, can I reproduce as much as possible in this problem at the discrete level? So the first thing is, we're gonna assume time is continuous. So we're just gonna think that we've done something in space, time for the time being, no pun intended, uh, we're gonna leave it continuous. So I do E dot. Okay, so here, okay, I had an integral in space, but we're saying we're discretizing space, so this becomes a sum of ui square delta. And if you have ever seen trapezoidal rules, or whatever, we, can, we might have some weights in here. It's not a big deal, but this is how we approximate our integral uh, by a discrete integral. We take the time derivative, same thing, I'm not caring about factors for two. Sorry, this is the sum over i. Right? Now I use the equation of motion because we are assuming that we are in the continuous, so I can replace the dot, ah, the dot by the equation of motion itself. But now we're doing discrete, so when I see u dot, I replace it by u comma x. But u comma x, we have a discrete derivative, so I have to put d. And now is where we kind of come to a halt. Because this operation that, that allow us to take this into that by iteration by parts is no longer uh, nece necessarily true. What we would need to do is to have an operator, derivative operator, such that when we get to the boundary, it allows us to cancel everything and just leave the two boundary points. So I'll give you 
the explicit example, again, using that derivative. Suppose we are doing dx is ui plus one minus ui minus one divided by two delta. And we're trying to do this calculation. Right? So just let's work out a few terms. So suppose there will be terms that go like ui times ui plus one minus ui minus one divided by two delta. Now the next one will be ui plus one, ui plus two minus ui divided by two delta plus, I'm gonna do one more, plus two, ui plus three minus ui plus one divided by two delta. And now I can just follow different terms. Here I have ui times ui plus one divided by two delta. And I have the same one here, ui plus one minus ui. So if I keep uh, canceling everything from point, the point one to the point n, let's say this is my grid, everything will cancel except the last few ones. And we're gonna have some quote unquote crappy contribution on the left and a crappy contribution on the right, which is not just gonna leave behind the left and right boundary values. Unless we say, wait a minute, we're gonna deform our stencil. Because after all, I still didn't tell you what the derivative is at that point. Because all, everything inside, I was saying something, but here I cannot, I don't have that information. So let's imagine that we instead define the x of u as we had before at interior points. But let's say we define it this way at the boundary point. So what I, I'm doing, and if you do the calculation using the Taylor, the Taylor expansion, is I'm dropping an order. This was second order accurate. This happens to be one first order. This happens to be first order. So I'm dropping an order. I'm losing something. But in return, what I get is everything cancel out, and this thing is true. I end up with dx square of u square. So that property is something that is known very creatively as summation by parts. So it's the discrete analog of the what you were doing at the continuum in the disc, at the discrete. You say, well, what a that big deal. I lost an order of accuracy. Uh, of course, I have some definiteness, at least, in how I'm gonna define my this derivative operators, but I lost an order of accuracy. Let me tell you what you gain. What you gain is that this is no longer an assumption. What you gain is to say, even if you go to the discrete in time, you're gonna maintain these properties. So if you had a bound at the analytical level, that bound gets preserved all the way to the numerical one. So if you have stability at the analytical level, at the formal level of mathematics, you're gonna recover it at the numerical level. So this, basically, that's the way with all the guesswork. You don't have to think, oh, what am I gonna choose for my derivative operators? How am I gonna deal with my boundaries? What am I gonna choose for a time iteration? This theorem tells you what you're gonna have to do. Of course, there is a requirement. Your iteration has to be at least third order accurate in time. Okay, so let's, re let's just rephrase our steps. We work to have a system of equations at the analytical level that is as good as it gets. It's strongly or symmetric hyperbolic. We can diagonalize it, all eigenvalues are real. We use derivative operators in space that satisfy summation by parts. That doesn't tie our hands at all. We can be as accurate as we, go, as we want. It might require more work, but these are operators one can open uh, references from some students or grand students of this Gustav, Gustafsson, Kreidas, Kreis, and Oliger that tells you, well, you want fifth order accuracy? These are your operators, and these are how they are to be deformed near the boundary. 
Uh, and with that, if you use at least zero accuracy in time, you're golden. This was the example for finite differences. The same applies for spectral, uh, the spectral decomposition. Because spectral decomposition, the derivatives in the spectral methods automatically satisfy the summation by parts. So the last ingredient I want to talk about, and we essentially have, as I said, I, w I wanted to eliminate all the guesswork. Yes? Oh. Your schemes to be forward or backwards instead of centered. Is that what's happening? Right. Um, yeah, so you want to just repeat so that, the question? Uh, yeah. yeah, just to try to understand what's happening, uh, what I think is happening, please tell me if that's what's no, no, happening. No, no, I know where you're going, and that's an excellent question, and you are yeah, helping so me answer. Yeah, so instead of setting boundary conditions, are you just changing your finite difference scheme to be forward or backward instead of centered? So. The answer is it's a combination of both. So you, the only thing I did here, and very, I'm very thankful for your question because that shows that I, I, I didn't say it clearly enough or correctly. The only thing this is addressing is, oh, my whatever recipe I have to take interior derivative points is no longer at, uh, attainable near the boundaries. I have to do something else. So this tells me this, what I should do to get something that is consistent with what I have at the analytical level. But at the analytical level, I still had to put a boundary condition. I still had to say, let's say, at the right I want zero. So this is just saying, this is a way to mimic whatever you're doing at the analytical level discreetly. So the boundary conditions I still have to put. So if I'm solving, might as well look at that. So if I'm solving this equation, right, for uh, Com for, for discretizing this right hand side, I will use this recipe. And if my boundary condition is such that I want the function to be zero at the right boundary, so say my initial, my initial problem was a little pulse there and I wanted to see it flow out of my computational domain, I will do this. This is how I'm gonna implement the left boundary there, I can, don't have the right to touch it. If I touch it, I'm gonna break it. So at the left boundary, I'm gonna try using this recipe without specifying anything in particular. But when I come to this one, I'm gonna set that one to zero. That's my boundary condition. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that question. Um, Thank you. Uh, can you just say what you mean by third order accurate in time? I don't really... Oh, good. So. Uh, Third order accurate in time. So suppose when I when I define this derivative, let's ignore for a time being the boundaries. I said, oh, take the value to the right minus the value to the left, divide by two delta. And we show that this is a second order accurate thing, right? The error was going like delta square. But I could have also done this this way. So now if I ignore the, the space, but I do it in time. And I can say, well, D, so I have U comma T here. I can say, well, this would be the same as U N plus one at the point I minus U N minus one at the point I divided by two delta T, right? So this would be an approximation I do in time that is second order accurate. This is not good enough. So I need something better and I can do something better. And for instance, Runke Kuta methods are very popular. Uh, they get the job done as you can go as arbitrary as you, uh, order as you want, but it will involve several levels. In fact, Runke Kuta methods are such that they start not formally with two levels, but they use the equation of motion to give guesstimates in between and then use all those guesstimates to combine a way to update from here to there that is at least third order accurate. So the error associated with it goes like delta t squared. Delta t cubed, sorry. Uh, so is that, is this clear? Okay, so last ingredient. Two things. So now let me go back 
And again, I'm thinking find a different thing, this find a different thing, but every now and then I tell you what the analog is in, in, in they say, spectral methods. So suppose we're doing this. And we're formally using derivatives uh, done this way. There is another theorem with a necessary condition for stability of the discrete problem. Done explicitly by that would mean we want to update from one time to another time, always using information we know. So I'm going to get this simply by using information in the past. Implicit methods use the information that I still don't know as part of the scheme, and those. Do, uh, do away with this theorem, with this restriction, at some cost. So let me just stay at the explicit level. The reason at the I stay at the explicit level in particular is that Einstein's equations are very, very complicated. They are highly nonlinear. So the implicit methods are very hard to implement, if at all. So let's just stay explicit. So every time we update, we're using information we know. So a necessary condition would say, take the point, for instance, that you're trying to, in, the, to get the solution in, or at, you know because you have analyzed the problem at the analytical level, you know what the speeds of propagation are for information at the previous level to get there. So if in the case of the wave equation, we know the speeds are one or minus one. And so we de define the causal domain of dependence, something that you have seen with, um, with Malcolm. But here we're thinking discrete, uh, discreetly, but it's the same thing, you ask what information in the previous hypersurface was required to update the solution at that point. And this came by the whatever speed of propagation my, my system of equations have. Now, if that's the, if that's this, this is the null cone, the past null cone, this is the, the analytical domain of dependence. The theorem says that it better be that the discrete domain of dependence that is, the points that I involve in the past to update the information should contain the analytical domain of dependence. So that is, if my analytic numerical domain of dependence is this, I'm good. I mean, intuitively what you're doing is if you use somehow, because of your choice, all these points, you're good because what you're doing is in some sense you're over, you're being over complete. You have all the information that the analytic, at the analytical level you require to get that point. If you violate that, if my analytical domain of the pen, if my numerical domain of dependence were to be this one, <laughs> there is information that I should be accounting for that I'm not because of my choice. If I violate that, then stability will be broken. Of course, usually that's not a very hard uh, condition to satisfy. I'll give you one example or just uh, use this as an example. Suppose that for whatever reason, in however way I've done things, I involve to update this point, these three points. Suppose I do that. And suppose my analytical domain of dependence happens, happens to be that. So I would be violating that theorem. My analytical domain, domain of dependence is from here to there, but because I'm only involved, interrogating these three points or involving these three points to update that point, there is this piece that I haven't accounted for. Well, the only thing I need to do is just reduce the size of this. If instead of coming going from here to there, I go from here to here, right? My analytical domain of dependence would be now that and I have more than enough points to account for that. Is that clear? It's very simple, but it, so this is called sometimes the CFL by Cura, for Courant, Friedrichs, and Levy condition. So this has to be satisfied. So usually that's not a big deal in that 
You might run your code, you might see the solution blow it up in your face, and then you say, well, what happens if I divide this, my time step by two? Or what if I make it 10 times smaller? Do I still see if I go to the same final time, the violation? And you usually, if you have done everything else correctly, you'll see that everything falls into place. So you're just using too, too large a CFL. And of course, that CFL depends on how rapid, what the eigenvalues of your matrix are. And every now and then, you might have a naive values that is just too large. In that case, your problem has become stiff, and you might have to think very carefully what you're, what you're gonna do next. But by and large, when you're dealing with Einstein's equations, things are pretty bounded, and just a very simple decrease of your time step will get the job done, if you have done everything else with it we have discussed. Is that, are we good? Excellent. So we're almost, I promise we're going to be looking at Einstein's equations at some point. Uh, so let me start here. Okay, some other things I want to say. Oh, and in uh, summation, in spectral methods, a similar condition arises. So usually, you will end up choosing a delta t equal to some delta x with some parameter here, which you can, oh, let me call it lambda, which you can freely change. So if lambda was one and you saw things blowing up, then you choose lambda equal a half and see if things work better. In spectral methods, this delta t goes like one over either n or one over n squared, depending on what basis you have used, where it's Fourier or Chebyshev, but it goes in more or less the same way. So it's got to be careful with this one over n squared. But the same, the same issue arises there. The last thing I'm gonna say it's related to something we wrote before. It's a consequence of the fact that even though we want to be integrating one equation, we're actually integrating a different equation. Remember I said, if you have d of f, and, you are, and since d of f is like f prime plus one, 6f triple delta square, there is some extra crap that your numerical problem is evolving that you want to get rid of. And for what you do, what you could do is analyze at the discrete level how fast things are moving. And it turns out, I'm not gonna get into these details, but if you care, I can explain perhaps in a smaller setting. So suppose I have some piece of the solution that is very smooth. That's great. Another piece of the solution that is varying in this scale. So this would be a long wavelength, this very smooth part of the solution, but then suppose there is this other piece that is kind of like that. So you can analyze at the discrete level, once you choose your scheme, how well these things are moving, are, co are behaving or captured by your numerical approximation, and you'll see is that you typically are doing very well with the smooth part of the solution, but not that well with the high frequency parts. So much so that you, these high frequency parts might not be even moving in the right direction or at the right speed. Especially in nonlinear problems, this might compound and give you absolute nonsense. Suppose you have this equation, which we said we don't need to care. This is a perfectly nice equation. This is a lower term. By all means, I really shouldn't care that much for that one. But discreetly, you have to be careful. Suppose we have this equation, this, 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 we feed this initial data. What, are they, what is that equation thinking that we're actually evolving? So suppose this goes from minus one to one. This is my u. My u square is this one square. So u square is a constant equal to one. So we went from something that was described by the highest po possible frequency that my grid can represent 
to the low, lowest possible frequency, a constant. So something that was supposed to essentially tell us, oh, something is varying this scale, all of a sudden when we square it, it went back to the low frequency. So this is some, a phenomenon called aliasing, which is the gener generic. This will always happen. This is related again with the things that we said at the very beginning. You better know that the problem you're solving is within the uh, available resources, that you can do this problem correctly. If you're working at the limits of the reverse solution, these things might actually come in and, and play a role. So for that, one thing we do, a very human uh, attitude is to say, we're gonna kill it, because we don't like it. Um, and that need not be a good joke. Um, so what will you do is to say, this is a piece of my solution that is artificially playing a role when it shouldn't. I, I know that the higher, the more points I, I, I put, the less and less these wave fre frequency will, will play a role, but then there will be others at the higher frequency that might also give me a problem. So for that reason, people use something called artificial dissipation. Which basically says, I'm gonna to add to my numerical scheme a way to mess up with the high frequencies so that they don't come and bite me. Because I know that my high frequencies have some error associated to it. Imagine this is the third derivative. The third derivative of something smooth is not that bad. But the third derivative of something that is very juggy will be pretty large. So then this thing might start to dominate in front of that one. And again, it's artificial, so I'm gonna try and control it. So this artificial dissipation is say, add something to your numerical scheme that will try and deal with that in a way that you can control. So again, I keep uh, writing that equation. Suppose you use this derivative operator for that. And for the time being, we're ignoring the boundaries. We think that we're solving this in a circle. So you know that you are making an error that it goes like delta square. So how would you mess up with it? So I can say, well, let me add, and this is not what we're gonna do, but let's suppose you do this. Delta, I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna do it that way. Delta, second derivative of u. Okay, so I put a delta here so that the units are the same. This is one over length, one over length. If I put a second derivative here, it's one over length square, I better counteract with, with a length. So I have these. And I'm gonna say, I'm gonna solve this problem as opposed to that problem. So I change it. But remember, we actually were not solving this problem. This, our, this was our wish. When in reality we're solving, we're solving this problem. So that's the problem we're solving in our numerical implementation because we chose that derivative operator. This has that which may act badly because we really don't know what the sign associated with the youth, the third derivative of u might be at any given time. But if I add this one, this is a Laplacian. This reminds us of the heat equation which wants to kind of clear out any ridges. And you say, well, given that I changed my problem to order delta square, I could choose to put a delta uh, and then try and control those high frequencies. You're gonna push back and say, wait a minute, here you work really hard to get a some, something that was second order accurate, now you're losing because this is first order change, right? This goes like delta. Well, I can still do this now. All right, so I put a delta cube. So I have added something that is smaller than this piece. Um, it is still dissipative because I have an even number of derivatives, so this will give me something that dissipates. And the epsilon will be something I can choose at my, this, at my free will so that it does what I want to the high frequencies, and I'll show you explicitly what it does. And so this will, I will do to counteract whatever this term is doing. So let me show you explicitly what that is, and then we, we can wrap up for this, and I think I've given you pretty much all the basic tools. 
So again, we're going to compare our favorite equation with this term thrown in. Again, we're going to use, well, let me just do it a simpler case, delta and delta squared. And I'm going to throw in an epsilon here. So let's use again our Fourier decomposition. This gives us S. This gave us IK. And this one is given with us what? Minus epsilon delta K squared. So the solution will now be locally E to the IKT times E to the IKX. And now we have E to the minus epsilon delta K squared T. So for the lowest modes, for the smoothest part of the solution, K is very small. K squared is a very small number. This is really not playing a significant role. But for the highest numbers, this is playing a huge role. It's dissipating the very high frequency number. And of course, you can see how these will go. So if I have whatever, like two n derivatives, and here I have n, two n minus one, um, then you're gonna have something like this to a much higher power. So this is artificial dissipation, which in finite differences is done this way by adding an operator that we know we can control and it has a sign that we can choose. In, uh, spectral, uh, in spectral implementations, usually what one does is evolve for one step and throws away every single mode that is higher than something, and then you keep going. So now then I promise, if you have done all this, you can sit down and write a code that will, get, will work from the get-go, modulo some things that we still have to discuss, but there is no black magic. So again, if you talk with old practitioners of numerical implementations, they will tell you, oh, there is a, a lot of twists and knobs that you have to move. That was the old days. I mean, once people understood this sufficiently clear, um, like I, I don't fiddle around with my codes. I, I work analytically, and then I know that something uh, will get me going without too much work. Of course, then they will, they will see it in the details, but this is how I would suggest anyone to start. Uh, it'll give you the best fighting chance for any problem you want. Um, any questions? I think I'll, this time, right, it's an hour. I think I'll stop here, and tomorrow we're gonna go to Einstein equations and try and connect, but you'll see because of the similarities of this structure of the equations, which with what you're gonna see in store in, in Einstein equations, we can progress fairly quickly, uh, knowing that we have all the tools pretty much to move forward. Thank you. I have a question. That form of the derivative operator is not random. We derived it in a specific way. And I'm now interested if we choose this dissipative term which does not agree with that formula about, doesn't Good. it affect our accuracy or the method we are using? Right, so, so the question is, your scheme, you said, I'm gonna use a second order accurate scheme or a fourth order accurate scheme, and I want that. So because your error here is like second order, you're gonna say, I trust my scheme is second order. So to not mess up with that one, you will want a dissipative operator that is higher than that order. So I could have chosen fourth derivative operator or 26 derivative operator. The, reason, the, the difference will be that this epsilon might have to be chosen larger. You just are trying to add a little bit so that it shaves off the very, very high frequencies. To not mess up with this one, right? So it has to be even so that it does the job. And if it is higher than this one, then you're still going to be able to say it's that order. And then you're going to, the last thing is you're going to say is I can prove that if I do the convergence, it will be with the order here and not, this is not getting in the way. Okay, okay.